what would running services in the cloud be without internet access? Unfortunately, granting and controlling internet access often ends up being the crux of the biscuit in many technical breakdowns and design problems that we see with users who are just coming into the AWS world. This is why in all of my courses I always go through a simple internet access checklist where we look at the four key elements of getting yourself onto the internet and receiving traffic from the internet when running EC2 instances in a virtual private cloud. And so the first item on our checklist is, do we have an internet gateway attached to our virtual private cloud? So over here in my diagram, I've shown the little internet gateway icon here, and it is really critical that we remember that there is an additional step called attaching the gateway to the virtual private cloud. Simply creating a gateway just brings it into existence out there in your account. You have to associate it with the virtual private cloud before we can make that internet gateway path available to VPC-based traffic. I usually describe the internet gateway as an uplink. And if people aren't really sure what I mean by that uplink concept, then I start describing, imagine your home router, and on the router you have little ports labeled local area network, and there's another port that might be labeled WAN, wide area network, or it might be labeled www, or maybe it says internet on it. That wide area network, www internet port, that is your internet gateway, your uplink out to your internet service provider. The internet gateway in our VPCs works very similarly to this. And the next item on our checklist is what does the routing table look like? Do we have a default route that points to this internet gateway? The first thing to remember is that every subnet has both a router and a routing table associated with it. Even if you don't create a custom route table, it still will at least have the default routing table. So over here's my little example route table that we're looking at. If we take a closer look at the first route, this one is the local route. This is the one that actually matches up perfectly with the IP address range for the virtual private cloud itself. The whole idea is that if we see traffic that is destined for something in this address range, it shouldn't leave the VPC, it should stay within the VPC. After that, we have a special route, and this route goes by a lot of different names. Some will call it the default route, sometimes you'll call it the route of last resort, Sometimes you'll hear people call it the default gateway. All of these basically follow the right concept. The point behind it is that this address pattern 0.0.0/0 is a wildcard. It matches all other potential destination addresses. And here's where it gets really critical. In our route table, we need to make sure that that default route points to the internet gateway. This is the logic that says if it does not live in or is destined for something in the virtual private cloud, then you need to send it out the internet gateway to the internet where they can possibly find somebody to answer that request. This is critical, friends. You can meet all of the other checklist requirements, and if you don't have this route configured correctly, none of it will work. And the next item on the checklist is do we have a public IP address assigned to the instances that want to be able to access the internet? So if we take a look at instance A and B, you can see that I do have IP addresses assigned to them. Keep in mind that this is what you would call a private IP address or a non-internet routable IP address. Now these addresses work just fine for talking to instances within the subnet or within the virtual private cloud, but they're not sufficient for us to go out and use them on the internet. As you might imagine, AWS supports a couple different public IP addressing options. And so the first option is a dynamic public IP address. If we assign one of those to instance A over here, instance A could use that to send requests to the internet and most importantly, receive replies back from the internet. That's the big difference between a public IP and a private IP. Those private IP addresses we talked about were not internet routable. The second option is using a static elastic IP address. So if I assign that to instance B, he would similarly be able to go out, make requests to internet resources, and receive responses back from internet resources. You should be noticing that both of these work the same way from an internet access perspective. The difference is whether or not the IP addresses are persistent across reboots or restarts of the instances. Those dynamic public IP addresses could potentially change across reboots or relaunches of instances, whereas the static elastic IP addresses are assigned to your AWS account and will remain the same as long as you keep those elastic IP addresses available in your account. In many situations, organizations won't assign a public IP address directly to their instances. Instead, they could use these private IP addresses and put the instances behind what is called a network address translation server. The NAT server simply allows them to take their private IP addresses and says, hey, no problem, I'll let you borrow my public IP address, and when the requests come back, I will forward them on to the original private IP address that made that request. 
Now, I'm not going to get into network address translation too much more than that. Just be aware that it is one of the ways to meet this public IP address requirement. And that brings us down to the final item on the checklist, and that is what do the firewall rules look like? Now you want to keep in mind that there are many different levels of firewalling that are happening within the diagram we have pictured here. The first layer we talk about are network access control lists. And NACLs live at the subnet level and have the ability to both allow and block traffic very granularly. Next you have the security groups. And security groups live at the network interface or EC2 instance level. Security groups have the ability to granularly allow traffic, but they don't have this blacklisting or deny rule that network access control lists possess. And last but not least, we have host level firewalls, and that is running inside of the EC2 instance itself. So this would be like Linux IP tables, Windows firewall, or some other third party network traffic filtering software that might be running on the instance. Each one of these checkpoints, the host level, security group, and subnet level network access control list, all have the ability to potentially block or restrict internet access. Keeping this simple checklist in mind as you go through designing networks, troubleshooting problems, and securing your infrastructure should help in a number of ways. Be sure to check out my other AWS security lessons where we take a look at how to use these resources to drive isolation and improve security for AWS accounts and resources. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Preview.